Yeah. Welcome to Accelerated. I'm your host, Vitaly Golem. On this season of the podcast, we're hearing from some of the global leaders in everything electric and autonomous, moving us quickly into the future. On this episode, I speak with Robert Falk, the co-founder and CEO of Enride. Based in Sweden, Enride is the first fully electric, totally autonomous transport vehicle to operate on public roads in the world. With remote monitoring and operations capability, operators can oversee and control the pod on demand with no need for human driver on board. Their electric trucks already count Oatly, Coca-Cola, Lidl, and Electrolux as customers. In May, the company announced its $110 million Series B as it gets ready to launch in the US. Robert and I talked about what he learned at the start of his career at Volvo Trucks, raising money by drinking a lot of beer in the early days, how Enride became the first heavy truck to race at Goodwood, and their record on the infamous Top Gear track, and what it's like to work with your spouse, and much more. Robert, thanks for joining Accelerated. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for for a few years, uh, almost from the beginning of the company, and uh, have have watched uh, you do great things and, and make great progress. The company is now five years old, so congratulations on everything so far. Uh, very much looking forward to the future. But where I wanted to start is, um, you know, for our audience to understand a little bit about how you got started in the automotive industry. For me, it was uh, we come from a long background. The university that uh, I studied in has a, really been a hub for a lot of automotive industry in North Europe. And Volvo is literally synonym with the university that I went to. And after I ended up in working from Stanford when after my studies, and I got to meet one of the founders behind other big, uh, so to say, visionaries behind Volvo Cars that now lives in Newport in Los Angeles. And um, he literally introduced me to a lot of the, so to say, how it is to work in automotive industry. He also gave me the best advice I ever got and it was to, if you want to be good at something, you have to know something. And that really inspired me to go back and really to learn something. So I started uh, as a production engineer on the floor, literally putting together um, trucks from scratch. So a lot of literally putting trucks together. That's how I ended up in the automotive industry. And you probably learned a lot. I mean, Volvo is uh, one of the most dependable, you know, one of the stalwarts of the industry. And uh, you got right into the kind of the heavy side of it. Um, yeah, most people probably don't realize how big Volvo is in the trucking business. Talk a little bit about kind of the, the trucking business in general and what you learned in Volvo. Now, from my perspective, it's just that I think that's uh, something one of the most the fundamentals is that in the cars side, the cars is literally give and take like for a four trillion dollar industry that's just the cars industry what people most people doesn't know is that the transport service market is just as big it's just the difference is that the trans the hardware part of it is just like 10 to 15 percent of it so that means that literally the transport mm -hmm. service market is a huge market that rivals actually the passenger cars uh, market in size so for me that was uh, quite a insight that they're quite early picked up on was the fact that these vehicles are meant for use and used for providing transport service and it's it's not a commodity or it's not the same logic as the car industry and uh, even if a lot of consultants always tend to be so say using the same format for automotive for uh, trucking side as for the cars it's literally two different business models it's two different uh, games and for me, that was really what stood out, that you really had two different markets. And for me, the trucking space is a little bit of machinery for transporting goods and not really a car. Yeah, quite a different market. And um, I've had uh, Gilbar Pasin on the uh, on the podcast as well. You might know him. And uh, he, he made switches back and forth from the trucking industry uh, to uh, helping Tesla set up uh, set up the first plant and now back to the trucking industry. And quite an interesting story. Um, quite, an, quite an important kind of under the radar for most people. They don't really think about the, the freight side of the equation. Um, now, what is the origin story about Enride? You know, how did you get inspired uh, to start the company, and what's the mission? From my side, it's literally ended up in when I where I Stanford, and I literally, I was I've been known to take a beer or two when the right occasion comes, 
So it's literally met up with a few of the people that became the Google sales driving team. And we discussed back then, I think it was over oh, literally at the party, discussing back and forth of how you can make something, a car autonomous. That's a little bit how I ended up in autonomous space. And a lot about the discussion, what's required, what it meant. And I was quite early on quite astonished with how you treated the whole from an engineering perspective. It's that uh, there was more interest of creating almost a medical being than to create and optimize something. There was literally about the AI behind self-driving rather than making something autonomous. So for me, that was something that I couldn't really come to terms with quite early on. And um, I took that with me during the years when I was in the automotive industry. And um, I also came on, been, the last part I had that worked when I worked at Volvo was literally running one of the biggest autonomous electric transport systems in the world. For me, that's how goods are being transported inside warehouses, in our factories. And the main reason behind why it doesn't have really picked up on outside the factories is due to legacy structures and the business model of the existing structures. So for me, it's uh, really stood out that this was a legacy and one of the biggest non-digital industries that were left. And for me, in uh, it was in 2015, I just came to the like came to the conclusion that there there are room for a disruptor here. And for me, it was also a big part of the what why it what worth taking the risk to do this is of course that the freight heavy freight transport industry is between stand for between seven to eight percent of global CO two emissions, and it's actually more suitable for going electric than the passenger cars industry. Yeah, I'd like to come back to that in a second. But um, today, you know, five years after you founded the company, um, talk a bit about uh, how big is the company? Um, you know, what kind of customers you're already working with? Uh, where do you have operations? Yeah, we are scaling revenue as we speak. I mean, we have a plan to quite rapidly. Um, we had some major milestones on the recurring revenue side. And we are currently 250 people and we are uh, rapidly scaling and we have multiple uh, Fortune 500 comp companies as customers. And with a few of the public ones are Electrolux, Bridgestone, Oatly, Lidl. And uh, yeah, we have more right now customers than we can literally keep up with. So for us, we have really switched from being in, uh, so to say, pre. A scaling phase and now it's all sort of say keeping up with demand and delivering and scaling how much of those 250 people are in sweden versus other parts of the world now we are closing in on uh, we will be 40 people in the u.s uh, before the end of this year and we're setting up a strong u.s presence and a lot of our sales is actually booming in the u.s in particular so for us uh, we are literally setting up office uh, several offices in the u.s based on the customer needs and the customers, both that we grow from the European market into the US market, but we have a lot of big customers, for instance, like the one we make uh, public with Bridgestone a few uh, few weeks back. And we have several other big ones that are uh, in the, the ink, but uh, we are not public with yet. So there's a lot of exciting news coming up now. Now, um, Enride has a little bit of a different business model. You're not selling autonomous electric trucks. You provide it as a service. Can you talk a little bit about the model and, and how you've come to this versus just selling vehicles? I think it has to do with a little bit of the dynamics of the market itself. I mean, if all machinery, the basic ma math behind a mach machine is that you have to have the best possible utilization of the, of the vehicle. And the structure of the current market is literally a bit disturbing, to say the least. I mean, a car, the fill rate of the old transport system is less than 20%. And then on top of that, most vehicles are not utilized more than 30% of total. So we're looking at the machining system for transport with an efficiency rate of 6%. If you had that kind of numbers in any other context, you would probably lose job for it. If I know for a fact that if there were any sort of machineries running at that efficient level, in uh, the system I used to work with before, that would be literally going out of business. And that's the same approach we've taken for the electric and electric autonomous. What we design for our clients is a highly efficient transport solution, literally with high utilization, and therefore we can have also have a great cost for it. 
So instead of instead of just trying to fit a legacy a new technology into a legacy system, we literally reshape the structure of it into together. So what we do and provide for our clients is literally installed capacity. So instead of a little bit just trying to sell, I think there have been a lot of funny incidents along the way here. I mean, for instance, there are a lot of companies out there pitching that they're going to sell self-driving to, for instance, the OEMs. And uh, there were some quite hilarious and a bit embarrassing um, conversations over the years with a lot of the big players in the self-driving space that doesn't really know this market as well. I mean, 85% of all the trucks are owned and operated by mom and pop shops. And are you going to sell self-driving to them? Or are they going to be the, uh, like some bit of, literally be the ones buying an autonomous truck? And a lot of those kinds of answers is something that doesn't fit that well into the current ecosystem. And that's, I mean, I think that we are literally proving that the business model changes as well. Because, I mean, the traction we have on the business model side and the new market fit is uh, quite extraordinary, to be honest. And it's just that allows to go to money and scale revenue. And I know it's very provocative in these days to actually scale revenue. I think that uh, it's something that we are very proud of. And I think this also can make us a stand out over time. But I think that um, uh, literally with all new technology, and I think it's one of the most important takeaways historically, is that once you get that disruptive technology, the business model also changes. That's absolutely true. Uh, Fred Wilson, um, famous investor, venture investor, talks about collapsing markets, so doing something 10 times faster, better, or cheaper, uh, or creating a whole new opportunity that didn't exist before. And, and you're certainly doing that. Let's try to make this a little bit more concrete. When, when a customer comes to you and they, you know, who, who is your customer and um, what kind of process do you go with them to discover kind of what their needs are and what can you offer them? From our perspective, our clients are the ones who have the shipping need. And where we start is literally saying, okay, what kind of need do you have? That's literally, for instance, take it to a big uh, chain of stores. We have a certain transport needs. And uh, I mean, the prerequisite for this industry is that you can match the cost. Uh, if you can't do that, you're not in business. So first, we design and develop literally a transport service and a capacity installation that matches the cost structure. In most cases, we can match it or even become more cost efficient than the current solution. And with that, we do a literally three to five year contract for them and provide them with autonomous and electric and sustainable transport solution for them. And what's that typically like? Are they moving freight within their factory or kind of short distances, long distances? It depends on the applications. For us, we do literally, the ones we doesn't do is heavy specialized goods and we don't do extreme long haul. And uh, so, I mean, at a lot of discussion of long haul industry or long haul, uh, that's a lot of people are discussing. The long haul is between 3 to 4% of the global transport service market. So it's a very niche market, but it gets, gets a lot of attention. Most transports are repetitive and boring and quite short distances. You can just look at the map of the US if you draw a line 200 miles from any coastline, you're going to cover a good portion of the whole population. And that goes for transport as well. So it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, using the basic physics behind it to a little bit tailor the solutions for it. And um, yeah, so we, we do literally uh, repetitive and predictable flows and on scale. That's a little bit how we approach it. And where can you already drive autonomously? Uh, as for us, it's more of a legislation challenge. And I think that since we don't have a, at all, we designed the system a bit different than others. We started with literally establishing the business, uh, the uh, safety case or uh, functional uh, safety first. So we literally started with literally proving each step and certifying each step onwards. So instead of doing a fancy speed control on level three, if you use the classical sketch, we literally started from to a little bit be able to do the first in a safe way and then increase the complexity over time. So for us now, it's more of a legislative uh, challenge to get literally that you can go autonomous without a safety driver because we don't have a safety driver in the vehicle. For the application that we are scaling and the clients we have, we do something we call AT1 and 2. That's uh, speeds up to 20 kilometers per hour because that's something you can get regulatory approval for currently. And that's uh, where we're scaling currently. 
but when it comes to more highway applications, we are scheduled to start those operations during next year's. Got it. And what do you think is a timeline? You know, there's a lot of hype out there about uh, autonomy on the roads. We know why, but uh, what's your timeline? When do you think that, uh, from your perspective, with with trucking and freight, you'll be on public roads openly with uh, full autonomy? My view is that. Uh, and what I support is that you shouldn't have a re uh, regular or like uh, overall approval. I think you should have uh, autonomous approval in certain lanes or certain applications. I think it's a completely different ballgame to go autonomous in a complex environment like cities. And uh, the most hazardous is probably rural areas. So I think it's you should have like literally like you have here in Sweden a warning for Moses. You should have literally warning sign for self-driving vehicles, for highways, for a certain roads and so on in certain areas you can have self-driving and i think that's the right approach for it a general free-for-all self-driving application i'm not a big fan of that's a very uh, very uh, pragmatic approach now let's take back a little bit i know that like many people in electric vehicles i know you especially are very passionate about the environment can you talk a little bit about the zero emission freight and how that fits into the big picture and kind of some statistics and numbers behind that Absolutely. I mean, I think there are a lot of debate of uh, they're actually electric is better for the environment. And I think it's just important to state for us. Uh, it's a very, of course, it's the purpose, but it's the prerequisite for what we do. And something for me it really stood out early on when I did the calculations back to what you're referring to a disruptive business case. Electric, we are going electric not because of the stability angle. The most disruptive here is that electric is actually cheaper per mile driven. So we're going electric because it's going to be the most cost efficient solution if we combine it with autonomous. So everyone that's going autonomous but not electric is going to have a worse business case than going electric autonomous. And the best case I've seen is literally 90% cost reduction for operating electric autonomous compared to a diesel application, diesel manual, that said. So for me, it's literally about the basic numbers behind it. And with going electric, of course, you get the op opportunity, depending on how you produce electricity, to reduce the CO2 emission with more, more than 90%. So for me, going electric gives you the opportunity to be able to reduce the CO2 emissions. But then, of course, a lot of other prerequisites need to be placed, how you produce batteries, how you produce electricity, and so on. But for me, going electric gives you literally the possibility to reduce the CO2 emission, not necessarily that you do. I, I had uh, Mate Rematz on a previous episode, and we were talking about uh, the fact that um, you know all of transport we saw last year when, when half the transport went away, we only reduced uh, emissions by about 5%. So maybe the auto industry is not the complete answer to that. Uh, but in fact, uh, food production is a much bigger polluter than the uh, whole transportation sector. I'm really excited to share something a long time in the making with you. My first online course. Over the years, I've trained thousands of founders through my book, Accelerated Startup, and my infamous Pitching Like a Boss workshops and keynotes. Like I've done for thousands of founders, I will teach you how to pitch like a boss. And for the first time ever, I will be doing it in a cohort-based online course. This is the world's most comprehensive and intensive course for entrepreneurs and future founders on pitching. It will help you craft the perfect pitch for investors and customers. It will also help you master public speaking. Get funded, communicate your vision to grow your team and dramatically improve sales of any product. Check out golem.net slash pitching. That's G-O-L-O-M-B dot net slash pitching for more information. See you there. The company, as we talked about, just turned five years old. Uh, I know you had a celebration with the whole team. Um, it was not easy to convince early investors to back your mission. Uh, how did you convince them ultimately? And has it become easier now that electric vehicles have become really inevitable? That's, uh, uh, it was a tough one. Uh, I think that uh, it's uh, in the early days, literally how we raised the money was one dinner at a time, raising $10,000 per dinner. So I think my personal record was that I had four dinners one night 
to raise $10,000 per dinner. And here in Sweden, if you want to raise $10,000, you have to drink at least two beers. So it's um, ended up being a lot of incredible, interesting conversations and a breakdown to a little bit having the faith in me personally and my co-founders as they're uh, in their ability to deliver. And that was literally what made us literally raise the first money. And um, it, that's how we raised literally the first uh, $3 million. We did it like $10,000 literally per time. So it was a lot, a lot of work to get there, but we managed to get there. And I think that has to do with the fact that a lot of pioneering work is that literally people didn't understand the basic science behind it. And I think it's uh, now it starts to stand in its house and much easier now that we have literally generating revenue, we have multiple customers, we have proven that it works, that you can transport this way and it actually works. And that of course makes a big difference and also gives it a big advantage since literally we have done a lot of work with this for a long time now. And so now we're literally in a very good position for the quick scaling that will happen in the EV business over the next five, 10 years. And I think it's uh, what really stands out from my perspective is that um, they are not necessarily always um, sort of the, the public opinion or the debate or the awareness of the debate is not always that closely tied to the actual industry or the fundamentals behind it. And I think that's something to stand out. And I think if we go back 2017, 18, Everyone in autonomous space were discussing how many miles have you driven? And I think that uh, that was the matrix that everyone was discussing back then. And we took a different approach and said, we're not going to do any miles because that's not a good, uh, so to say, choice for how good you are at uh, autonomous. And that was very provocative back then. But if you play forward now and lost, I haven't got a single question on that last year and a half. I don't know one is discussing how many miles anyone has driven, but this is poor matrix of how well you're doing autonomous. And I think that's kind of, so to say, what we're probably going to see here moving forward as well, is that a lot of basic fundamentals is going to catch up to people. Because I mean, there are a lot of people in autonomous, there are a lot of people that gets into both trucking space and autonomous space that are not that familiar with how the dynamics works, what is the fundamentals of the industry. Something I learned over the years is that Silicon Valley, it's not an operational, it's not a manufacturing culture. It's uh, a beautiful place, but not always, so to say, how to put it gently. It's, uh, it's literally... Uh, very optimistic uh, approach that hits reality. And uh, it works very well on a software platform or with those kind of models. But when it comes to actually putting hardware and metal together, it's a different ballgame. It's um, different types of skill sets. It's a lot of hard lifting, literally. Yeah, I would say uh, there hasn't been silicon in Silicon Valley in a number of years. Um, all of that's in other states and other countries now. And, and of course, Silicon Valley investors are going for low-hanging fruit, which is easier to scale software. Um, but it's been interesting to watch because uh, both you and I have been involved in the automotive sector for some time. And now all of these companies, including yours, are getting so much attention um, from the investment community. But, um, you know, these are overnight successes that were five years or more of blood, sweat and tears in the making. So it's, it's really interesting to watch uh, a lot of a lot of my friends here um, getting a lot more attention now and getting finally getting the respect that they're due. Uh, for changing the biggest industry in the world, the transportation industry. So a little bit more fun. Um, you, you've had some fun along the way besides the fundraising beers. And I hope you you don't uh, dis build a distaste for having drinking too much beer. Um, you know, I had a little too much tequila once when I was very young and, and then I didn't drink tequila for a number of years. <laughs> so hopefully you, you, you're, you're still a beer drinker. Tell, talk a little bit about how you got Enright involved in Goodwood and the test with the Top Gear track. That's actually quite, uh, that's actually a great and a quite a funny story because when we launched uh, the, uh, we launched the pod and uh, we keep, keep getting the, uh, like, uh, and that this weird reach out from the Duke of Richmond like literally a very formal header and like listen so it's almost like those what what's it called that in uh, in us is like and um, you get emails from third world countries for like asking for money and they claim they're a prince of something or 
like the use of fancy title and ask you for transferring some funds and so on. The Nigerian scam. <laughs> exactly. And we thought it was literally one of those because there were literally someone calling that we are um, Duke of Richmond ask for your sort of say presence and want to take part of this because I actually never heard of the Goodwood before this. So no one at their team literally know what it was. And that person literally it was reaching out and we were like, come on, we didn't reply. And then we just said kindly, like, refused or to put it very <laughs> gently, I think that uh, they were not really used to being reacted. So they literally was, I wouldn't say the way offended, but they were literally a little bit intrigued that we would keep sort of saying, telling them off or like refusing their proposal. And so they did a very formal return and literally called me and like, this is what we are, and this is the opportunity. Can you please come and like do something cool together with us at the event? And then we had a lot of conversations, and then back we decided to uh, do a, a premiere or like a launch of uh, our T log at the Goodwood Festival. Yeah, by the way, for, for our audience uh, of people that don't know, Goodwood Festival of Speed is one of the top uh, automotive events um, in the world every year. And there's a famous uh, hill climb uh, part of the part of it where supercars usually, and new supercars sometimes premiere and they and they drive along this uh, kind of narrow test track. So a racetrack rather. So yeah, and, and uh, you guys put the pod there, which was uh, interesting to see. I think the biggest thing before there was maybe a Range Rover. Um, and now you put you put a you, you put a lorry in the British terms on on the racetrack. So, yeah, how, how did that come about, and kind of what were the results of of that? I think the part of our strategy has to start to take this, like I said before, steps that we increase our functionality. So to say, that's how you do in most robotic systems. That you literally have boxes of functionality that you increase, and you can increase the functionality over time. And that's the same approach we have taken for our system, and. The, this, uh, the downside of taking that approach is the public opinion about the, about speed. Because when we were the first in 2019 to go on public road with an autonomous electric transport vehicle without the driver in it, a uh, lot of the comments was about the speed. And the speed was not that we couldn't go faster. It was just the regulation and uh, so that limited the speed. And therefore, we wanted to do something fun to connect with it. So the second uh, Goodwood asked us to do come back and do something the next year. And then we a little bit thought, what can we do that it's both fun and a lot of good display of our ability. So why don't take a, a pod around the racetrack? And that's no one has done that. So let's do that. And uh, for me, that was a lot of, I mean, it's not hard to motivate great engineers to do both something that's technically a technology challenge as well as fun. So we uh, combined the event at Goodwood with uh, also with the Top Gear track, because for me personally, I grew up with the Top Gear show and uh, I'm a big fan of cars. So it was a good opportunity to get to that track as well to uh, have some fun and of course to uh, race. So we have, the, as best of my awareness, the speed record for the fastest autonomous electric pod around the Top Gear track in the UK. Have there been any other autonomous electric trucks on that uh, Top Gear track? Probably not yet. Not not yet. I don't think that anyone else had the ability. The first and the fastest. Exactly. I'd love to put that challenge out there. I mean, it's uh, it's. Uh, I think it should be a global challenge for all the manufacturers out there. And it's a good way to motivate a lot of people. And I mean, back to why we do and why we built this company is because we want to change the industry and we need a lot of more people to help us to do it. So I welcome anyone to try and bring it on. It's competition is good. I mean, if you're afraid of competition, you're literally afraid of winning. I, I would encourage everybody to take a look, uh, you know, look it up on YouTube and ride Goodwood and and ride Top Gear. Uh, great little videos you'll find uh, very entertaining. So. Um, yeah, maybe Laguna Seca next when you when you bring it to California. Uh, that that's a little bit more challenging track with the uh, elevation changes. Now, what are the next big milestones for the company? What do you have coming next that you can talk about? For us, it's uh, literally we had some delays due to Corona when it comes to the U.S. launch. We have been working quite a bit with a lot of big clients, but the official launch 
has been postponed literally a year. So now we have the big launch in the US coming up and a lot of new product launches in associated with it. So we're going to see a lot of new things in uh, the, the launch there as well. So, I mean, um, the future of mobility doesn't stop. It's a constant uh, innovation. So we always love to bring new things to the market. And our ambition is literally to provoke and and see what you can do different. I mean, it's uh, uh, a lot of new things that we can can be introduced and rethought if you just give it some space. And our ambition, ambition is to keep doing that. And uh, me personally, I think it's fun. And uh, it's uh, the harder, more people say that it can't be done, the more triggered I get to uh, get and get it out there and get it done. And so we're going to launch in the US and start to get serious with the clients that we have. And we have a lot of cool installations on the way in the US. So for us, it's uh, it's uh, going to be great fun to get more serious about the US. I think that Ground Zero and uh, Showdown for the autonomous and electric space will be the US. And I, I love that uh, there's a pros and cons with the American market. But when it breaks down to it, it's... It's uh, home of rock and roll. Home of rock and roll and a lot of trucks, I think, more than anywhere in the world. Yeah. Very good. We'll be looking forward to seeing a lot more of the autonomous uh, pods. And they're very obvious because they don't have a cab, right? Um, so it, it's, it's very strange to see this thing driving itself down the road with nothing that where a human could even possibly sit. Exactly. When companies start to catch fire and blitz scale and look for capital to fuel that growth or look to find the right exit strategy, they often seek the counsel of investment bankers. At Drakestar Partners, we work with some of the leading companies in global tech on capital raises, M&A, corporate carve-outs, SPACs, and much more. And we're pretty good at it. Our team of over 100 technology sector experts across nine offices in six countries is comprised of not only career bankers, but experienced executive venture investors and technologists. Drakestar Partners is the number one ranked and fastest growing mid-market investment bank across the US and Europe. While I focus on mobility and energy transition sector, along with all things Silicon Valley, my partners from the Pacific to the Atlantic and around the world lead in software, media, communications, and everything in between. Learn more about us at drakestar.com. Um, one kind of personal question, you married your co-founder and CMO, uh, Linnea. What is it like to work in a startup with your spouse and uh, what, you, what you feel comfortable saying? And um, what's your typical day like for the both of you? Now, for me, it's the best decision I think we both made. And I think that um, it makes, uh, we met in another startup and we are both passionate entrepreneurs and we love building companies. And uh I think it's uh, it's a true privilege to share your ambition and goals and dreams and every day with the person you love. So for me, it was been, I mean, if you're not married to your uh, founders, you literally become married with, to them. So for me, it was, uh, I think that the other side is that I think that it's like the founder dynamics is very important for any company and to have literally, and you need to have a strong relationship and a common ambition for things. And for me, I, I was born and raised in the farm and where literally all the family, they do work together. And that's literally how I sort of say, make friends that I love working with people. That's something I've done my whole life. And so for me to uh, literally get the opportunity to work with both my best friend and happy to call her my wife, um so I'm just very pleased with it and the most natural thing. And and what's your typical day like? How do you, you know, you have long days. Uh, we're talking now, it's morning California time, evening in Sweden. Um, what's a typical day like for you with a global schedule? From, from my view is that being a founder of a company with this ambition and there's no, literally no normal day. I mean, it's, I think that to be able to work with uh, your teammate to literally to get your work uh, so to say, um, combine both work and um, the little bit spare time you get and the, and to kind of be able to plan that together, it's a true privilege. So for me, it's uh, normally you get up quite early and uh, and then we happen to have a, a small dog as well that needs to take care, care of as well. 
But then we go about to everybody's business. I think the biggest pros is that you can literally plan your day and you can help to plan together. Since we work in the same company, it gets easier to like, we can do a launch if we'd like to. And um, so it's, um, I think it's, um, yeah, it's best possible setup for me. I, I love how we have solved it. I'll, I'll have to ask her one day and, and see if she agrees. Yeah, hopefully. Um, <laughs> hopefully. No, but it's like we, I mean, we have a third partner uh, in the end right of founder. And I mean, it's like, I'm not saying that we're married to him as well, but I mean, being founders of a company that's, it's, it's, it's a literally very close to, I mean, in, in word you call band of brothers, but uh, I think it's literally the band of founders. It's a very special bound for when you've been through the hell and back together. Yeah, and by the way, very similar to how Eventbrite got started. Right? It's a husband and wife team and the CTO. So uh, that that worked out well for them, ultimately. It's actually a very common setup. Yeah, I, I guess it's more common than, than we, we think. As an investor, it's always been uh, you know one of these red flags. Do you really want to invest in a couple? Uh, because that adds a, another potential fail point, but uh, that's a, a different subject for a different day. Yeah, it's a fun fun fact is actually that the Koenigsegg is actually the same setup as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah, didn't didn't realize that uh, his wife was involved uh, in there. But um, yeah, it, and uh, also a neighbor of yours, and and in, in the uh, automotive industry. Mm. You know, I like to close with this uh, this question always. You know, with with founder CEOs uh, going through this journey is such a formative process for somebody. You know, your your sense of identity is really tied with your company for a long time, and hopefully everything works out well. For for times when more often when it doesn't work out, um, it can be very difficult on people. Now, knowing what you know now, what you've learned in the past five years, really running this company, what advice would you give your young self starting at your career? That, that was a tough one uh, for me uh, i think that uh, never give up i mean it sounds like a cliche but you're quite often that's what you judged on because like uh, and i think there is uh, literally don't trust the experts it's another one i really like myself because if you're doing something right truly pioneering they don't will not know shit sorry my french here but uh, it's uh, if you truly know what you're doing trust yourself and keep pushing mm -hmm. and uh, of course you should adapt to advice and listen but at the end of the day be true to yourself and survive and like surround you with the people that believe in you and um, also choose the right people to work with and the people that support you no matter what and the people that will be your friends afterwards i literally have my two best friends as uh, co-founders and um, for me, that's uh, made a difference. So I literally trust the right people around you and be picky with you, who you surround you with, because that's going to make uh, all the difference. That's the culture. And and you, Robert, you're an easy guy to get along with. So I'm not surprised that uh, you have such a great dynamic in, in, the, in the company. And I'm sure the culture in the company is, is doing great. That was our conversation with Robert Falk, co-founder and CEO of Enride Autonomous and Electric Trucks. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to give us five stars in your favorite podcast platform and share with your friends. See you in the next one. And in the meantime, you can always find me at golem.net.